2 Peter 3.9 says, <clears throat> The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I know this may shock a lot of people, but there was a time when I was an Arminian. <gasps> yeah, I know. Uh, you, you must be stunned. But alas, it's true. I was not. I have not always been a Calvinist, believing in Reformed theology. There was indeed a time when I believed, foolishly, that man, on his own free will, could come to God without any help from God. I thought I accepted Jesus on my own accord. Then I actually read the Bible. So, what I like to do is I'd like to actually take a look at this verse, because I've had this verse actually brought up to me since I've been a Calvinist. I've had this verse brought up to me several times by... Uh, people who message me on MySpace and His Holy Space, which is a Christian version of MySpace, and they message me and say, oh, look, it says right here that God wants everyone to come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. So Calvinism can't possibly be true. Well, <clears throat> as, uh, as many of you know, and if you don't know, then here's a little tip for you. You can't just go at a verse with your man-centered idea and your own interpretation and read that interpretation into the text when you when you read the text. Um, you should read the Bible for what it's worth. It's very important to always look at a context at a given verse so that we know that we're interpreting the text correctly. Um, so let's actually look at uh, second uh, all of Second Peter actually to kind of gather the context. Now in the context, uh, we see that there are two groups of persons being addressed. You have the you and the us, you have like you and us statements, and uh, it's a very personal, uh, it's a very personable statement, it's a very friendly statement. And then you have a, uh, a statement uh, referring to they or them. Uh, it's very impersonal, and we're going to take a look at the scripture of Second Peter in several different verses to actually look at how this actually does in effect, impact what Second Peter three nine really says. So, who is the us and who is the they? Let's look at Second Peter uh, one verses three and four. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Okay, so the us, as evidenced by this verse, is the Christians. Christians are his precious partakers of the divine nature. This is just one example in this wonderful letter. And there are many other examples of the you and the us, meaning the Christians. Let's go now to uh, 2 Peter 3.1. Uh, in this verse, Paul identifies the you that Paul is writing to. He says, This is not the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. So then, who is beloved? Who is Paul writing to? Well, that's easy. Just look back at verse 1-3. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, in verse 3-2, as I read, this you language is present. Let's continue to uh, verses 3-7 through seven of chapter 3. That now we encounter the they language. This is in contrast to the very intimate you language of the previous verses. The they scoff at Christians and follow their own desires, uh, verses, which is stated in uh, verse 33. <clears throat> they, ta they taunt Christians about the coming of the Lord, the second coming, of course, and deny God tes God's testimony about creation of the world through God. This is found in verses uh, 4 and 5. It's very clear that the they is not referring to Christians. Christians do not doubt God's word and ridicule themselves. We know that God's uh, word is true and that Christ is coming again. We do not scoff at this as the they are doing that Peter is referring to. 
So understand the context. You have the, the you and the us language, which is referring to the Christians. You have the they language, which is referring to non-Christians. Now let's proceed to verse 3 eight. Again, there is the beloved being addressed. Same language used earlier. Beloved is the you of the letter, the Christians. Paul is encouraging them that, yes, Christ is going to return, but it's not necessarily according to our timetable. We think that he's taking a long time. He's really not. But the reason that he's taking a while, well, we'll find that out in the very next verse. Now again, let's take a look at verse 3-9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's reason for slowness, as compared to the timetable known here on earth, is this. He's patient. He's a very patient, loving God. He's slow to wrath. So the question is, who is God patient toward? You. It says it right there. He is patient toward you. So who is the you again? We already stated this. It's Christians. God is not willing that any should perish. Any of who? We've already addressed who we're talking about. The you, Christians. He wants all to reach repentance. All of who? Christians. Paul is addressing Christians. He wants all Christians, God wants all Christians to reach repentance. God is patient and waiting until all of his elect, Christians, predestined before the foundation of the world, to repent. Rather than defeating Calvinism, as many think it does at first glance, and certainly I remember being an Armenian and I remember doubting Calvinism just because of this very verse. Uh, but in fact, this verse is actually a very strong verse in favor of Calvinism. It's one of Calvinism's greatest supporters. God is waiting that all of his elect should come to him. And this is because Calvinism is biblical. It's not merely a system that mere man has devised. So again, we need to look at the context of the verse. We need to see that there is specific language used for the you, us statements, and the they, them statements. Of and it goes on. Peter continues to address the you and the us in, in his letter. And it's obvious that it's about Christians. And, uh, and I, I can further make a, uh, an entire... Uh, sermon by Dr. James White actually available on my website. I'll, I'll post the link to it. This is actually uh, a sermon that actually really helped me uh, understand this verse in its context. Uh, many American churches are preaching this corrupted uh, gospel, which is Arminianism, and claiming that God is waiting for everyone to come to repentance, that there is no elect. Well, these are certainly lies. Calvinism is very biblical. And uh, I thank you for watching this. I understand that this has been a very long and lengthy conversation. Um, I really hope you've understood it. If you haven't, well, watch it again. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is a very important to understand the context. And that aside, I mean, we should always judge the unclear of things that are clear. There are clearly verses that state that there is an elect, that God has predestined us before the foundation of the world, us being Christians. Uh, to be in his family. And it's very important to look at the unclear in light of the clear. And certainly this verse is an unclear verse at first. But and you just compare this verse, which seems to say that God it's God's will that all come to repentance. Compare that to Job forty two two, which says very clearly that God's will won't be thwarted. God isn't some lowly old man up in heaven watching a TV, wringing his hands, hoping that we come to repentance. He's a sovereign God. He is in control. So, just by comparison of the Armenian interpretation of 2 Peter 3.9, it fails. Because, in, again, Job clearly states that no one can thwart God's will. God's will is eternal, and his will is going to be done. Man can't mess it up. So if it was really God's will that all come to repentance, then all would. There'd be no one in hell. But this, my friend, is universalism, and it's a heresy. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope that you've learned a little something. And uh, 
hope that you might be a little bit more convinced or encouraged that Reformed theology is biblical. Thanks. God bless. Have a good day.